Hello and welcome to Chimera, Britain's only book festival celebrating science fiction, fantasy and horror writing. My name is Anne Landman and I'm the festival's founder and artistic director. Right about now I hope to be welcoming you to beautiful Edinburgh, to our venue The Pleasance, for a weekend packed with events. Writing workshop panels, readings, open mics, a quiz, a Cayley, two plays, we had so much in store for you. Thank you for joining us online instead to be part of our programme from the safety of your homes. We're very excited to still bring you a fantastic lineup of speakers. We'd ask you that you support our speakers, and there's many ways you can do that. You can buy their books or borrow them from the library. You can donate to them directly via their Patreon or Coffee. You will find the links for that below in the description. We encourage you to buy a ticket for our events, even the pre-recorded ones. All ticket money will go directly to our speakers. You can also donate to the festival and all donations via the donation page will be split between our speakers once we've covered our costs like the Zoom account. Thank you again for joining us in this brave new world of digital events. We hope you have a chance to check out all 33 of ours over the weekend. Please let us know what you think of them. Do get in touch via social media the chat function in Zoom, or drop us an email on info at chimerafestival.co.uk. We'd love to hear from you. We hope you have a fantastic weekend, and we look forward to seeing you in person next year for Chimera 2021. Okay, hi everyone, and welcome to Chimera, the sci-fi, horror and fantasy writing festival based in Edinburgh, but coming at you from online world this year. Um, I'm delighted to be chatting with Ben Oliver and Catherine Evans today and before we start I'd like to introduce you to them both. So please tell me if any of this is wrong because I didn't steal it from the interweb. So Catherine Evans is an award-winning author and an accomplished public speaker with a background in theatre. As well as writing YA, she flirts with poetry, fences competitively, belly dances for fun, runs a farm with her husband on the south coast of England and volunteers as co-regional advisor for the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. Catherine has two children who are mostly grown up and two cats and a puppy who are mostly not grown up. Catherine's first novel, Why and More of Me, was awarded the Edinburgh International Book Festival First Book Award in 2016 and the SCBWI Crystal Kite Award in 2017. Today we will be discussing her latest novel, Beauty Sleep, which was recently published by Osborne. Is that okay? Is everybody, is everything all right there? <laughs> yeah, that, like everything <laughs> is perfect, except obviously I am not fencing competitively at the moment, nor no. am I even training or doing anything. <laughs> <laughs> now moving on to Ben. Welcome, Ben. Hello. Ben Oliver is a writer of YA, sci-fi and speculative fiction. He grew up in Scotland and began writing long before he could spell. Ben attended the University of Stirling where he studied English but spent most of his time trying to write a novel. Ben's first short story was published when he was 18 and since then he's been published in over a dozen literary magazines and anthologies. Ben's futuristic YA trilogy The Loop was published by Chicken House earlier this year and has been optioned for TV by Lime Picture. Mm -hmm. oh. That's Yep. Any news on that you'd like to share or is that a conversation for another time? Uh, I'm not really allowed to share too much about it apparently um, but yeah <laughs> there's a, a few developments and interesting things but sadly I can't talk about it. <laughs> oh, we sold well, film rights for more of me 18 months ago. Uh, not allowed to talk about it. Yeah it's a secret. one of those weird things. Yeah <laughs> well welcome both and today we are going to be talking about as I said ooh, beauty sleep. And even though this is the advanced reading copy, I do have the amazing cover that will be on the loop. Oh, there we go, Ben, well <laughs> done. Thank you so much. Uh, so yes, these amazing, amazing stories that you have created that made me not sleep very well after I read them <laughs> because there was so much going on. Absolutely fantastic. Um, so this event has a theme of changing worlds. Um, from reading both your books, you, know, you go from Luca's imprisonment in the loop to Laura's controlled existence and beauty sleep. Can you give the viewers a brief summary of your book um, about the worlds you've created and how you figured out the stories that you wanted to tell? Kathy, would you like to go first? Yeah, um, you, 
I'm really bad at doing like elevator pitches for books. So I was going to cheat and read you the blurb from the back of my book. Which I'm going to do. Um, Laura can't remember who she is, but the rest of the world knows because Laura is famous, a dying girl who was frozen until she could be cured, a real life sleeping beauty. But what happens when you wake up one day and the world has moved on 40 years? Could you build a new life? while solving the mystery of what happened to the old one. So what I was trying to do when I wrote the story about um, this girl who was frozen in time was to look at how life has changed over really the last 40, 50 years and potentially where we could be going in the future is the idea. Brilliant. Did you ever have any dreams where you thought am I going to wake up and I'm in the, the right world? Is, I mean, is it like a dream state that you ever thought that you would ever have being in something like that? No, the, not really. I mean, I've always been fascinated with cryogenics. The idea, I mean, I've, I've, I'm a massive sci-fi fan and it's, it's been a thing that has featured in all kinds of, from Star Trek to Red Dwarf. Um, and it's always held a bit of a fascination for me. But what really tipped the balance into writing this book the way I did was that a couple of years ago, a young girl in this country, a 15 year old girl who was dying of cancer, went to court with her mum to get permission to be cryogenically frozen. That actually happened. And that made me think, you know, this is really pertinent and I should write about this. This is, you know, it's a possibility that, that this could become a more generalized thing. Fantastic. I didn't know about that. That's interesting. Um, ben, would you like to give us a, a brief introduction to Luca and the loop? Yeah, I'm also really bad at these elevator pitch things. So I've written bullet points and stuck them to the side of my laptop. So I'm cheating <laughs> as well. <laughs> uh, the loop, it's, it's a sci-fi prison break story um, that takes place in a young offender's death row prison uh, set in the future. Um, where the prisoners have the option of pushing back their execution date if they take part in like scientific and medical experiments. Um, and really, initially, I wasn't really trying to say anything. It was just a cool idea, I thought. And uh, uh, it was, wasn't until I started writing that I realized that was, the themes were about, you know, the, the, the prison system and kind of using and abusing lower classes um, so, yeah, yeah that, that's kind of I realized those were the themes and when I went to redraft the book second and third drafts I really tried to bring that forward and uh, but it really just started with that idea in my head and uh, I just thought it was a really cool idea and would make a good action-packed story um, yeah and it wasn't until the second or third draft that I realized that I'm trying to tell trying to say something more than just tell an interesting story yeah, I mean, we, we touched on earlier before we started recording about the fact that um, after we'd, we'd read the loop, we were like, oh, you can't leave it there. And then we realised that there's going to be more. So thank you for writing more. <laughs> Otherwise, I might, I might not be speaking to you right now because that, that was quite harsh. But what an amazing way to end the book, I have to say. Anyway, enough about the endings. Can, we, uh, can I ask you to both read uh, the first part of your books? Would that, would that be okay? Yes. Cathy, do you want to go first? Yeah, well, I selected a different reading, actually, if that's okay. okay. Yeah. And because I, the title of this panel is Changing Worlds. I wanted to, because um, it takes Laura a long time to uh, wake up and be able to fully engage in her world. But when she does, that's when you start to see how the world is shifted. The 21st century was getting on my nerves a bit. Fine, I'd do what I'd been asked, shopping. Besides, if I was gonna to go to that stupid posh school, I needed clothes. I didn't wanna get my head kicked in for having the wrong jeans. Letitia, can you find Topshop? Are you sure you want Topshop? I can recommend clothing outlets more suited to your style. <laughs> Was my computer judging me? I said, I'll decide what suits me, thanks, Letitia. Find me Topshop. Here's what I found. Up came a shop front, complete with an assistant saying, Hi, what are you looking for today? I can recommend some tooth whitening products. Seriously? Was there a conspiracy to make me even more worried about my not white teeth? How did it even know? 
had Natisha been listening to me talking to Maria? I shuddered. The assistant continued her sales pitch. We also have some great offers in uplift bras. I looked down at my nearly flat chest. It was like being 12 again and back in Chelsea Girl with the snobby assistants looking at me and Stace like we were scum. Only now I had no Stacey and no idea of what to buy or even how to buy. How did you even try anything on? The assistant read my mind again. Order now and we can deliver in two hours. All returns are free. Two hours. All right, tiny psychic shopping woman, show me some jeans. Up they popped, picture after picture of jeans in all shapes and colours, and adverts ran down the side. I smiled when I saw one with Miss Lily holding up a pale green bottle. Try my new skincare range for young adults, made with you in mind. The picture <laughs> rolled away and was replaced by a new one. It was me, at the press conference, with a banner splashed across it. Get Laura's 80s style. An arrow pointed to my two big jeans and my yellow sweatshirt. I poked at the image and it took me to another page. Laura Henley, 1980s dream queen and self-confessed shopaholic, inspires one of this season's key trends. Big. Big on hair, big on size, big on colour. One of the first things Laura said when she was revived after more than 40 years in the deep freeze was, I can't wait to go shopping. Well, Laura, we're with you there. They were using me to advertise their products. Could they do that? And that quote made me sound so shallow. It was totally out of context. Well, I didn't need Laura Henley's style, thanks. I already had it. That's fantastic. You know, normally we would be in a room with an audience who would be clapping right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and you know, the range of emotions that she goes through, you know, you just can't fathom really coming out of 1986 and waking up and 40 years have passed and you you know you, you weren't aware of mobile phones or the internet or anything like that and I do remember Chelsea Girl uh, yeah I, I can totally relate to that. <laughs> it was a but, lot of fun yeah. actually yeah. looking at, at that you know in my own life sort of cutting out that middle section where I'd learned everything to do with the work stuff and thinking what if you took me when I was 16 and dumped me now with well actually slightly in the future if I push it a little bit ahead you know trying to anticipate where we're going um, yeah in the next sort of 10 yeah. 15 years wow that's brilliant thank you very much and um, Ben would you like to read an extract from the loop for me please <clears throat> yeah of course so I'm gonna start at the beginning the harvest begins and all that exists is fear this is how it goes every night at the same time. Minutes pass, or maybe hours, it's hard to tell. But at some point I begin to hallucinate. My mind recoils from the pain and the panic, and I'm no longer in my cell. I'm standing on the roof of the Black Road Vertical, the kilometre high tower block where I used to live. The boy with the blonde hair is screaming. He's trying to pull a weapon from his pocket as he steps backwards towards the edge of the building. And the girl in the witch mask is getting too close. If I don't do something, he'll kill her. Stay back, he screams, his voice cracking in his rage and dread. One last hug and he frees the pistol from his pocket. He takes another step back, increasing the distance between him and the girl in the mask, and then he aims the gun at her head. My eyes snap open as the harvest ends, and I'm left completely drained on the hard concrete floor of my tiny gray cell. My heart beats so loud and so fast that I can hear it echoing off the walls of the clear glass tube that surrounds me and reaches from the ceiling to the floor. I try to brace myself for what comes next, try to hold my breath, but there's no time. The cold water falls from the ceiling so relentlessly and so powerfully that I'm sure I'll suffocate. My lungs are on fire as the tube begins to fill with the chemical laced water. My exhausted body begs me to suck in oxygen, but if I do, I'll drown. After what feels like a hundred years, the grate opens below me and I'm sucked to the floor. The water drains away and I'm left choking and gasping for air. My breasts come out in ragged coughs as I lie naked at the bottom of the tube. The heated air comes next. A blast of constant wind that's so hot it's on the very edge of burning my bare skin. Once I'm dry, the air stops and the tube lifts, disappearing back into the ceiling for another day. For the longest time, all I can do is lie still on the cold floor. In the loop, this is the closest thing we get to a shower. 
a government approved waterboarding. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> now, normally there would be complete silence at this point in time because everybody would be in awe at what you've just read. So I'll do that look for you. <laughs> that was just absolutely amazing. And you know, it, both of your worlds um, transported me when I read these books because. You know, it's not just the main characters that you you really get involved with here. It's the supporting cast that you you've both written to go along with these characters. Um, did you reconsider any of the roles when you wrote them? You know, maybe Luca wasn't quite Luca when you first drafted, or maybe um, Laura was slightly not the Laura that eventually came out in the books. Did you consider any of your characters and and change them as you went along? Ben, would you like to answer that first, please? Um, yeah, like I said, when I first had the idea, it was just the idea of people in a death row prison in the future who could push back the date of their execution if they took part in scientific experiments. I didn't really have any characters to begin with. Um, and the very first time I sat down to try and write it, um, the main character was uh, a man in his 30s. Uh, it, it was mostly just him there wasn't much of a supporting cast and I think I got I do this quite often I got about 10 or 15 pages in and they scrapped the whole thing and I didn't go back to it for about another month or so it just wasn't right it just wasn't right in my head and uh, that wasn't the character that was supposed to be telling the story um, yeah and then again it, sometimes it just feels like these ideas incubate in the back of my mind and when I'm ready to write it, I know, and I just sit down and start writing. I think I just jumped too early. Um, yeah, so originally, I can't remember the character's name, but he was this guy in his mid-30s, and he was very different from Luca. And <laughs> Yeah, so, but when I did sit down to write what turned out to be the, the loop, um, Luca was just sort of there, and he didn't really change much from that point. When I kind of sat down to write the loop, like the actual version of the loop that, that turned out to be Luca, was pretty much the character he was from the start. Um, maybe by the end there was slight differences. I went back, I had to make a few tweaks in early chapters, but he was, he was quite well rounded and almost a finished product from the beginning. That's brilliant. Yeah, very lucky because sometimes yeah. it takes a while for the character to kind of find themselves and for you to to get all free with what they're trying to achieve and, and their yeah. end goal, you know, so that's, that's brilliant. Kathy, what about yourself? For me, Laura and Shem actually came from a different book. So I was originally taken on with my agent many years ago with a book called Skin and those two characters were in it. But I started writing Laura because I had this sudden image of um, a girl trapped in a room, quite a sci-fi sci room, lots of stainless steel. Didn't know why she was there. I just had this very vivid image and was sort of driven a bit to understand what her story was. So I wrote this story with her and Shem, and Laura was a really aggressive, fighty, feisty, go-getting girl, never questioned herself. She just pushed, pushed, pushed all the time, a bit like my older sister, actually, mm -hmm. genuinely like that. Mm -hmm. um, and the book, I loved the book, but it didn't sell, and I put it away, and I didn't think about it for a very long time. And then these two characters just wouldn't leave me. So I came back to them. But Laura had kind of morphed over the years. And when I really thought about her, I, I thought she, she's a reluctant hero, mm -hmm. Laura. She, do, she just wants to get on with her life, um, not really have to push herself or do any heroics. She doesn't want to do a lot of the things that she has to do. And she's a bit rubbish at it. You know, she, she genuinely looks ridiculous when she's trying to sneak into the clinic in a onesie with the rabbit ears because it's cold and dark and she's hopeless really but she she manages she does it and I think that's for me that's a lot of us that's what a lot of us are like you know in our everyday lives we sometimes have to do not heroic things but things that really push us and that we don't want to have to do and we're all doing it now aren't we in lockdown mm -hmm. so so Laura developed quite a lot Shem was always exactly how he was and I think the circumstances of him although the story changed hugely I mean I completely rewrote um UGC but not at all the story of skin but Shem's circumstances were very similar he'd been through similar experiences and he didn't really change 
much. He just muddled along in his own grumpy way all the way to the new book. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, then obviously Cathy just uh, related to her sister there. Is there anybody in, in your life that you take characteristics from to create your your um, characters in your books or do you tend to just do they just morph into what you have um yeah a little bit so i don't want to say exactly who because they might be offended but um, <laughs> yeah um well i'm i'm an english teacher as well so and writing for young adults and teaching young adults there's certainly characters and character traits that i can borrow from time to time but nobody's a hundred percent somebody from my real life or um you know or or 100% taken from the real world and plugged into my writing. I, I just made little character traits and little things. Uh, and I think with every writer, there's a little bit of myself in each character. Um, I think I think every writer does that as well, especially with your main characters. Um, yeah, so definitely put little bits of myself in there and uh, try to put myself in the situation of the characters and say, well, what would I do? What would I think in this situation? Mm. Um, and if it's somebody completely different from me, I try to go the opposite way of what I would do. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a really interesting point as well, because when you're looking at um, developing character, you can own, you can't really know somebody else's truth about themselves. Like I can talk about my sister and, and how I think she's like this go-getting, courageous, fighty, but inside she may not feel like that. And I will never know the truth of that. I'll never know the truth of that. Only she will know that. But when we're creating these characters and putting depth into them, that's up to you. So that, that layering um, that evolves, like Ben's saying, putting yourself in the character's mind, the characters kind of develop while you're going through that process and asking, well, what would they do? How would they handle this? Yeah, definitely. And, and both of your characters, you know, when, when you, you've managed to do what a lot of writers esteem to do is when people close the last page, days later, I was still thinking about Luca and I was still thinking about Laura and I thought, wow, you know, that it's amazing that they're still with me. What would, you, I mean, we talked in, um, in our prep for this event about the fact that if your characters met in real life, um, a lot, they want to be these amazing leaders, but they didn't quite, well, I don't want to do any spoilers. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's, it took them a while to kind of get to what they wanted to achieve, shall we say. Um, what do you think Laura and Luca would say to each other if they met, or maybe any other characters in the books? Ben, who would you quite like to see in your book meet from Kathy's book? Um, well, look, <clears throat> the question of what they would talk about Laura and Luca if they met, it might depend on when they met. Certainly in the, in the loop, uh, there's a bit of a war going on by the end of the book. Again, I don't want to spoil too much, but um, if they met at that point, Luca would probably try to recruit Laura into the resistance or whatever they're calling themselves um, but if it was a calmer time uh, after a war if that ever happens um, if they met they would certainly have a lot in common like you said and a lot to share a lot of similar experiences um, yeah characters I'd like to see meet um, Shem uh, from Beauty Sleep and Malachi, I think, would have interesting dynamics between them. Yeah, Malachi yeah. from the loop, he's a, and uh, who else? Well, I think most of us who, who would love dogs in, in the loop. Uh, <laughs> Panda, she would love dogs, so she would get along with Shem and, uh, oh, I've forgotten his dog's name now. Scrag. Scrag yes. <laughs> I love dogs in books. Scrag's one of my favourite characters. <laughs> yeah, well, it's funny you should say that because I get contacted by readers quite a lot saying, I love that this dog exists as a character. Yeah, he's yeah, not yeah. just a stuck on thing. You know, he's not an ornament to the book. He is yeah. a genuine character. And the relationship between Shem and Scrag is a real a, relationship yeah. and very important, very important mm -hmm. to Shem. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's because I have dogs and mm -hmm. I love them. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking Malachi and Marsha. That would be funny. <laughs> that would be yes. really funny to put Malachi and Marsha together. <laughs> Fireworks. 100 yeah. <laughs> percent I think Luca and Shem would get on. Because Shem yeah. doesn't talk to many people. As mm. he pretty much keeps himself to himself, trusts nobody. Yeah. But I think he would like Luca because although Luca 
has this pretensions to being the hero, really. Uh, he also knows his limitations and he's actually, he's quite lovable. He's quite lovable. He strikes me as quite a gentle, lovable character. He cares. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think Shen would see that. See That's that. nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, so technology, obviously, in your book, Kathy, technology is, it's from 1986 to a futuristic mm. date. And then obviously, Ben, you've got all this technology in the, in the, the loop that, oh, it was so cringy and <laughs> scary in some parts. Um, you know, obviously you didn't go into a carogenic state to, to get an idea of what it was like, Kathy, but you know, like what research did you do um, for the technology involved in your books just to make sure it was um, spot on and realistic to that time? I did do quite a bit of research into that because I needed to understand what was possible, what was really possible and what was potentially possible. And there are a couple of strands to that, the cryogenic thing. So there are websites where you can buy yourself a position in the cryogenic pod and you can literally read what the process is they put you through. So I ransacked the internet, but there were other things as well. Um, for example, you can have cryotherapy where you go into a tank um, and your body is frozen. That's supposed to help with your fat or something. Burn, <laughs> squeeze your fat off. I don't know. Um, that happens. People pay for that nonsense. Um, what other things with cryo cryogenics? Oh, and I read, I read other people's descriptions of cryogenic capsules and things. Uh, Marcus Sedgwick had written a book of short stories, and in one of the short stories, there were four stories. I can't remember what the book was called. It had like a strand of DNA, spirals or something. They're all connected by spirals, the stories. Uh, and he wrote about cryostasis in that story. Um, and that was quite useful for me. I mean, I didn't end up writing anything like that, but it was quite useful to see how other people had approached it because it feels like a really unbelievable thing. But actually, we are so close to that technology and people are already utilizing it in some degree or another i mean some of it is nonsense you can see why you can see why it's this constant yearning for eternal life that's what it is and that's something that has run through millennia mm -hmm. but yeah you need to get it right i think if you are if you're going to have people buy into your story ideas mm. okay so there's no secret underworld near you down south that um, has little pods. There might be. In. There might be. There, <laughs> who knows? The, the, the only other thing I wanted to mention about technology is that for me, because it's not that far in the future, it's like, you know, 2028, 20, I think she's reviving. It's touchable. So a lot of the things that I have in the book are already at their, at their early stages now or are being used, like driverless cars and um, maybe not, tracker serums in your blood but who knows that's going to definitely be possible because we have nanotechnology already that's being used it's not crazy the stuff i'm writing about and the same with ben although it seems like it's really far-fetched it isn't it's not that far-fetched to think that you could have something implanted in you that would literally stop your heart if you crossed a barrier yeah. it, it's potentially yeah. possible mm. that's true yeah and ben what about yourself did you go into any prison like environments to kind of get that feeling of what it was like to be in that solitary world or what was your, um, um, what was your way? Uh, well in terms of researching the tech the technology side of it um, I made a lot of it up without researching I just thought that's kind of the one of the fun things about writing futuristic sci-fi is you get to just make things up and you can make them work in your own mind and that's fine. Um, I did do some research into medical science and breakthroughs in medical technology. There's like the sort of upper class in the world of the loop um, known as the alts, the altered um, have things like mechanical hearts and mechanical lungs. Um, so they're never at risk of heart attacks and uh, they're always, they're never out of breath because these mechanical lungs process oxygen into their blood. 10 times more efficiently than lung, human lungs could. So things like that were completely made. I mean, mechanical hearts exist to a certain extent in terms of uh, 
heart transplant operations, you, you can sort of circulate blood around. Uh, I can't remember what they're called now, but but not you can't currently replace a human heart with a robotic one. But that's not again, that's not too far fetched. Um, in the future, these things could easily exist. Whether people would voluntarily, you know, have their heart removed and replaced with a robotic one, I don't know. Um, when researching prisons and things, I did a little bit of reading into into prison systems in different countries and you know how brutal and corrupt they can be um but uh it was more the ex using prisoners as subjects for experiments that i researched which has been done a surprisingly lot like it's how it happens to this day using prisoners and people in vulnerable situations who have no other choice calling it volunteering but really what choice do they have um, sort of forcing them into experiments and things has happened. Uh, and I also, also reading short stories, there's a Stephen King short story called The Jaunt. Um, about, it's all about the invention of teleportation technology. And in that, when the scientist who invents this teleportation technology realizes that it, it messes with your, you have to be asleep when you go through or, or mess with your mind because it, it feels like thousands of years have gone by. Um, so they send prisoners through they and and that kind of sparked the idea as well or sort of reinforced the idea of using prisoners as subjects um for experiments so it's a really good short story as well yeah the wow. <laughs> um, now i've asked you both um to very kindly read a second extract from your books um you know um <laughs> No spoilers, obviously, because we don't want to. I, I, there's so much I want to speak to you both about these books, but I can't because obviously, you know, people, some people who are watching um, haven't read them, so I'm not going to go down that road. But um, I just wondered um, if you could perhaps read a pivotal moment that maybe changes certain things in your books or introduces a new character that um, is, is relevant and essential. Uh, ben, would you like to go first? Yeah. Um... <clears throat> Like, uh, as I said, um, the loop is set in a prison and at some point they have to break out of that prison. So this, this scene sort of takes place during their attempt to break out and most of the prisoners are trying to climb a wall when this happens. A second later, I realize what Blue has realized. Mabel thinks we're going through the rat tunnels. She doesn't know that we changed plans to climb the walls. Blue begins to descend the wall as quickly as he can. Shit, I hiss. What's happening, Panda asks. Take this, I tell Kina, holding out the trigger. She carefully grips it and I throw myself over the ledge, getting my hands and feet in place as quickly as I can. Mabel, wait, I hear Blue screaming below me. I look down and see that he's almost at ground level. He drops, feet thumping down onto the concrete and sprints through the open door and into Igby's cell, screaming after the girl as he goes. Blue, I yell, but he's gone. I climb down, faster and faster, my hands and feet barely maintaining grip as I go. I make it to the last three metres and then drop down, the shock of the fall sending pain through my ankles, but I ignore it and sprint after the boy. I can hear his voice calling after Mabel from somewhere along the long, curving corridor, and I run as fast as I can after him. I finally catch sight of him as he crosses the threshold and onto the dark train platform. Blue, stop, I call. But as I gain on him, I see him jump down onto the tracks and sprint into the darkness. There's no time to think of the danger as I follow him onto the tracks and into the tunnel. I can just make out his shape in the gloom of the tunnel. He's almost close enough to grab, but then Mabel's agonized screams echo out, filling the subway with horror. No, Blue cries and moves faster into the darkness. Mabel screams again, and this time the sound of the hissing, screeching rats is intertwined with her voice. No, no, Mabel, no, Blue screams. Now I'm close enough to grab him. My fingers close around the material of his jumpsuit, and he falls to the ground. It's too late, Blue, I tell him, holding him tight. She's gone. Let go, get off me, he snarls, as he thrashes around, trying to break free. Mabel screams again, this time a quieter, gurgling call as her life drains away. Get off me, we have to save her. Listen to me, she's gone blue. We can't save her. And if we stay in these tunnels any longer, we'll be next. That scene. 
<laughs> oh my goodness me when you started reading I'm like, oh no no i'll cry <laughs> Rats yeah the, yeah i think there was there was lots of moments when i read the loop where i actually held my breath and it wasn't until i finished a paragraph that i thought oh i need to breathe now here i need to breathe <laughs> well, that's good that's what oh, i was aiming for <laughs> so tense yeah but just brilliant absolutely brilliant thank you thank so you. much for reading that um kathy you. would you like to read your next extract please yeah i will i thought you should meet shem <laughs> so shem is homeless um and he is being pursued by people unknown and he decides to um, do something about that so he's heading to the train station i'd never caught a train before hell if i could see it wouldn't it <laughs> i've never caught a train before i'd never caught a train before so i watched People just walked to a gate. It looked like you didn't even need a ticket. I picked up Scrag and tried to follow someone through. They passed through fine, but the barrier stayed shut in my face. I pushed at it, but it stayed firm. I looked to my left. Someone else just walked through. They weren't doing anything special. The gate just opened for them. My heart started to race a bit. It was embarrassing, like everyone was part of a club and I was excluded. Someone tapped my shoulder. I flinched against the barrier, but it was a young mum with a baby in her arms. You need to charge your air pay, she said. What? On your phone? You must have run out of credit. Oh, yeah, thanks. I stepped back and she walked through. There must be some other way. I looked around for a ticket machine and spotted a sign. Air pay only. Cash is no longer taken at the station. I wanted to punch something. It wasn't fair. I was shut out of everything because I was poor. I kept hold of Scrag, tears building at the back of my throat. I sniffed and headed away down the hill. Maybe we could hitch to London or walk. I wanted to write about um, how different the world is for people of different classes you know how and um, because we so often perceive it through our own vision that is not the way life is like for everyone so that was why i wanted to write about shem feeling really just shut out shut out from society which of course he is because he hadn't got a bank account uh, do you know it's, it's the little things that the, a lot of people take for granted that they don't realize affect yeah. others um yeah i mean your 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 book was just amazing at kind of going through the whole tranche of society and saying, well, these people get this because of this and these people get this because of that. And it was, oh, it's just, it's an amazing story how it doesn't really matter where you are, where you're from. And um, you get two people who have the same ethos in life and they get together and they can then share experiences regardless of what class they're in, you know, and I think that's really important. It was such a, poignant moment that actually you know and, and you know he'd lost so much and all he wanted to do was get on a train and he was just like and he just couldn't do it it's just oh um so you're both writing similar but very different stories um i mean obviously ben you you've got some really dark elements in your story how do you step back from that so you've could you give us an insight into your writing day? So obviously you're writing all these amazingly dark thoughts and then you don't want to go to bed with all that in your head as well. So what, what do you do um, when you're writing? Do you, what's your process to get through that? Um, well, when writing The Loop, um, like I said, uh, I'm an English teacher as well. So I was writing, I was kind of getting up at 5 a.m. getting to work a few hours early so I could write in the morning. Uh, this was the loop, like it's my, it's my debut novel and it's, I got my agent through this book and everything. So when I started writing it, I didn't have an agent. I didn't have a book deal or anything. So it was just writing it because I really enjoyed writing. I've, I've been writing for as long as I can remember. And I just knew this idea was something that I, I really liked. Uh, and like I said, I just thought it was a cool idea when it popped into my head. So it was fun to write. There was, it was never a case of feeling like I had those, I was taking those dark thoughts or dark moments around with me. I mean, 
I do sort of feel emotional and sad if I'm killing off a character or putting a character in a bad situation, but it's also fun as well. I, I, I kind of enjoy the, I, it does, that makes me sound like a bit of a psychopath, but <laughs> I enjoy kind of, <laughs> um, but I think, you know, all my favorite books and movies and, and, and things, the tension, the moments of tension um, kind of come from the moments of peril and, and putting characters that I care about or that I love in, in peril is, is, is fun, um, whether they make it out alive or not. Um, I never really had that like, feeling of taking it with me once I'd finished writing. I was just excited to get back to writing. Um, and see what happens next. Um, so yeah, my writing process was get to work a few hours early, write for a couple of hours, teach, and then stay for a few hours or an hour after to plan the next day's lesson, and then get up and do it again the next day. And yeah, I said I just look forward to to writing the next chapter. Obviously, there were there were moments where it slowed, not quite writer's block, but it slowed down. There were moments that were difficult to write, but for the most part, I really just enjoyed writing it. Even, even the dark and scary parts, I enjoyed writing. <laughs> Wait, <Kathy? Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. It's not dissimilar actually when, well, maybe it is a bit dissimilar. When, when I first started writing, same situation, obviously that like most of us, no agent, no publishing deal. You just, you're writing speculatively. You hope you'll get published, but yeah. Expect it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it took me 15 years to get a book deal, so it yeah, takes a long time. So my kids were quite young, so I, and we run the farm, so I'm working full time. I have two children. Um, I'm fitting writing in, in those little slots of time that become available. So, for example, drop, picking the, my daughter up from ballet, I'd take my laptop and I'd write in the car while I was waiting for her. I'd take the kids swimming, and while they were swimming, I'd, I'd be writing. And actually, that way of working really suits me and whether I've learned to adapt to it or whether that's just my flighty brain it works really well for me I can work in intense 20 minute chunks and then do something else and that's how I work now even though life has a little bit changed um, I rarely sit down I would never sit down and write for eight hours unless I've got a deadline and I have to force myself and then it will be editing usually not writing um, yeah, I do the same thing. So I'm, I mean, I'm still working. So I do a bit of work, a bit of writing, walk the dog, a bit of cleaning, a bit of writing, call my daughter. To write. I mean, it, I still work in the same way. Um, and I know a lot of people would find that really very disjointed way of working, but it seems to work for me. <coughs> very good. Um, I, no, I can't do the early shift. I used to do it a couple of times a week and oh, it's, I saw it, my hat's off to you, Ben, for, for doing it that early. But then, you know, yeah. it, when you want to write, you do, you find the time to write because it's it's part of you, isn't it? A day doesn't go by when you don't think about it. So it's good mm -hmm. to get some words down, even if they're just... Yeah, I was much more likely to work late into the evening. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I had to be up early anyway, because they started, my kids started school at stupid o'clock. So, yeah. you know, their, their school was 40 minutes away on the bus and they started at 8am. So... Mm. Yikes. It was an early start anyway. Yeah. Not anymore. Mm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not talking about lockdown, by the way. They've just grown up. <laughs> yeah. My son is 20 now. He can get himself places. <laughs> and and what um what writers influenced you when you were younger? You know, a lot of uh, a lot of when you go to a lot of panel events, a lot of the questions are like, when did you start writing and whatever. I'm, I'm always interested to know what writers you read as, as a young person um, and how they influenced you um, to actually put pen to paper and think, oh, I, I really want to do that. That's, that's a big part of me. Um, what about yourself, Ben? Um, well, like, there's quite a lot of horror aspects in the loop. As I just read that extract there about rats eating people. So um, <laughs> uh, I remember being very young and being terrified by... Um, Goosebumps books by R.L. Stein. I remember reading them and being really scared to the point where I couldn't sleep when I was, I was like nine or 10 years old. And then the next day, going back and reading more, uh, knowing that I'd be scared and not be able to sleep, I just, there was something almost enjoyable about that, that fear and that like believing so much in, in these worlds. And 
again, I sort of graduated from R.L. Stein to Stephen King, still too young, uh, and kind of seeking out that fear again and, and being terrified all over again and strangely enjoying it. I'm really coming across it as a bit of a psychopath again in this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Uh, yeah, I, I enjoyed horror. And then when I found like sci-fi and dystopian books, uh, I realized that there were elements of horror in them, but, but uh, just science fiction, I find it is just infinitely fascinating and you can do almost anything with it, including adding horror elements to it. So, you know, even when I started reading things like uh, Fahrenheit 451 and 1984, and just thinking about these writers way back then, thinking about what the future would be like and uh, getting scarily close, uh, even in allegorical kind of ways, it was fascinating. It's almost like a challenge. Can you kind of become a bit of a futurist, look into the future and uh, ask yourself, you know, where are we now and where is this path going to take us in the future? What's, and usually what's like the darkest scenario because that's the most fun to write. Um, so yeah, it was a mixture of horror and sci-fi and also things that I watched were almost all exclusively science fiction as well. And that definitely influenced the way I write and the way I plot. Well, I don't really do much plotting, but just the way I think about stories. So. Yeah, a lot of horror and a lot of sci-fi. Brilliant. Kathy? Yeah, we have some of those in common, actually. But I, I think of the way I write now as uh, a consequence of everything I read. So like, I call it book soup. I call those books you read a, sort of percolated inside of you and, and they produce the writer that you are. And I read a lot of classics as well. I absolutely loved Thomas Hardy until I read Jude the Obscure and then I if he hadn't been dead already, I'd have sought him out and killed him myself. Um, Dickens, love Dickens, obviously the Brontes. I love those books about um, society and community and family. Um, but then I went on to read Orwell. I read everything Orwell wrote. And that element of sci-fi was a surprise to me in those books. Um, H.G. Wells, Isaac Asimov, you know, those books... I could think of Divergent now. That's basically um, an Asimov story that's been rewritten. Mm. They, they were there. They were doing it. And it was so much further away. Like, we could, it's a touchable thing for us. And it really wasn't for them, particularly for H.G. Wells. I think mm. the War of the Worlds was a, was a phenomenon. Mm. Mary Shelley, Frankenstein. You know, that's a science fiction book. We think of it as horror, but it really is science fiction. And it's, it's the same thing. It's, a, it's an allegory. I get so excited about it because these books really are just wonderful. And yeah, Fahrenheit um, 541. I mean, in that burning books, horror to a kid that just lived in a library. It was a sanctuary. So I, yeah, I read a lot of classics and a lot of um, science fiction. And then of course, Stephen King. But unlike you, Ben, I went, I'm never going to sleep again in my life if I carry on reading these <laughs> books. So I, I stopped reading Stephen King, but it was enough to put that spoonful. I think mm -hmm. it's like it's like the spoon's been in the sugar and you've stirred it through your coffee. It's just there's a trace of that in uh, in my writing. It's all it's all in there. You know, we all we build ourselves on the on the our, our writing selves on the blocks of what we've read. I really believe that. I really believe that. In fact. One of the best comments I ever had was a really bad review. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't say this, but you know, Kirkus reviews, are, and everybody wants a great Kirkus review because it really helps your book sales in America. This is for more of me. And I got, I've got this Kirkus review and I read it and I was like, oh. it said, um, more of me is more mean girls than Carrie. Stephen King's Carrie. And I was really upset. And then I thought about it and thought, no, wait. That's exactly what I was trying to do. You know, I want to write books that really connect immediately with teenagers and their lives now, but that have that little bit of a thread of something other in them. And I think that's what I do. So they may not like it, but that's my intention. <laughs> what would you say in, I mean, your, I hate to use the word journey, but I will, uh, in your writing journey so far, um, what would you say is your greatest achievement? Ben, you want to give us an idea? I'm, it's just getting <clears throat> like emails and people sending tweets about my, my book. I think that's, 
that, that, I mean, I, I mean, the achievement would be writing a book and getting it published. That that was uh, an incredible achievement. But the but he, just people enjoying it and read like everyone tells you not to read the reviews, but I, I do it every day. I, I go on Goodreads and Amazon <laughs> and read my reviews every day, which I shouldn't do because I only focus on. Don't that. do it. You will trip yourself up one day and you'll yeah. be miserable for about six weeks. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I, everybody tells me not to. I still do it. Um, and I do only focus on the bad ones. I should stop doing it. But every now and then <clears throat> someone will say something in a review or a tweet or something that like they just completely got what I was trying to do or trying to say. And every time I read them, I'm like, yeah, I'm really happy and like proud that I've, I've written this book. And, you know, that, that's probably, I'd say, the greatest, the, the best things that have come out of it so far. Excellent. Kathy? I'm going to come at this question from two angles. Okay. So <laughs> aside from, from screaming my head off when I finally got a book deal after years and years and years, it was the, the external thing achievement was Carnegie nomination for more of me because libraries and librarians have mattered so much to me in my life. And I'm such a big supporter of them. And I think, you know, when we talk about people being disenfranchised, you get rid of libraries and you are taking away a resource that poor people really need. And I know that because that, that's been me a couple of times in my life. Uh, that hasn't changed. That's still, that's still the same, regardless of what technology we have. So the Carnegie nomination was an incredible moment for me. But internally, it's persistence. And it's not just before you're published. It's the persistence to keep trying to make the best book you can make, even when you, it's just, you just, it's exhausting sometimes. That sounds so pathetic because all we're doing is writing. But my current book is so hard to write, the one I'm working on at the moment. And I know it's still not right, and I know I have to keep plugging away at it, and there's no point in me sending it to my agent yet, because I know it's not ready, and I don't, you know, I don't want to keep re-going over it, re-going over it, but you have to, if you have that niggling doubt that it's not right, you have to just keep going, and that daily persistence is, I think, my greatest achievement for a flighty brain. He doesn't like sitting still. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Thank you so much. Now, before we uh, close, um, I have a question <clears throat> uh, from a, a viewer online, Ben, for you. Um, so in the editing process for The Loop, was there anything that was considered pushing boundaries too far and needed cutting, or were you allowed full freedom to explore and sculpt your dystopian future? Um, <clears throat> that's a good question. Uh, in book one, all the cutting was really stuff that, like I said, this, this is my debut novel, so there's a lot of things I didn't know about the whole process. <clears throat> and in book one, there were sections that were lifted out, and then my editor or my agent said to me, look, if you lift this out, it doesn't change the story at all. And even if it were scenes that I love, they'd be like, look, if you take this scene out, it doesn't affect the characters, it doesn't change the ending, so it's not driving the story. And getting used to the fact that, you know, it doesn't matter how much you love a scene or how much you worked on it. If it doesn't drive the story, it doesn't affect the ending or the plot in any way, it can be taken out because it's just slowing the pace down. <clears throat> um, but there was nothing in book one that was considered too, I was going too far or it was too gruesome. But I'm writing book two just now, I'm about the third draft of book two and me and my editor are working on it. And there is a scene that uh, initially what to take out completely because it was completely, it was way too gruesome and, uh, you'll know it when you read book two. Um, but I, I fought to keep it in, but I've toned it down a lot. And it's, it's still it's still a lot, and it's still quite gruesome, but um, I managed to fight to keep it in. So again, you'll, you'll, know, you'll know that scene when you read it. I can't say too much about it again, because it's in the second book, which isn't out yet. But yeah, there's just one scene in two books so far that I've had to tone down a lot. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much, Brent. That. Um, so that unfortunately that's us for today. Uh, thank you so much for spending your time with Chimera and um, we wish you all the best. We can't wait to see what's coming out next and book two when it's done. Ben. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you so thank much you. for your time and have a good day. Thank you very you much. You too. Thank you. Thanks very bye much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.